Today we will learn and reflect on the epistles of Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius was being escorted to Rome for his eventual martyrdom, where the Romans would coax the lions to devour the Christians in the Colosseum to entertain the masses. But during their journey, the soldiers' guardian stopped off and allowing fellow Christians to visit him, and he wrote many epistles to the local churches to urge them to keep the faith and not fall into heretical beliefs. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we use for this video and the history behind this ancient work, like how many manuscripts survived. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Eusebius, the ancient church historian living during the reign of Emperor Constantine, speaks this of Ignatius. There is evidence that Ignatius was sent from Syria to Rome to become food for wild animals because of his testimony for Christ. He made the journey through Asia under the strictest military guard, encouraging the Christian community by homilies and exhortations in every city where he stayed. In particular, he warned them to guard most carefully against the heresies, which were then first becoming prevalent and exhorted them to hold fast to the apostolic tradition, which, as he was now on the way to martyrdom, he thought it necessary for safety's sake to set down clearly in writing. Now think about it. Does this make sense to us? The provincial governor receives a request from Rome to furnish Christians to feed to the lions, so he finds a local bishop and sends him under his way, under the strictest military guard, but yet this visitor is allowed to receive as many visitors as he wants, who seemingly stay as long as they want, and then the guards allow him to write epistles to send back to their communities. Now, in the modern world, this just would not happen, but the ancient system of justice is quite different from our own. There are no prisons in the ancient world, only jails. And often jails are filled simply by those who irritate the authorities. If you break a law in the ancient world, you're either fined, exiled, or executed. There are no long prison sentences because there are no prisons. The state doesn't have the resources to run a prison. So when you're thrown in jail awaiting a hearing, the government expects your family to visit you and bring food with them and feed the prisoner and maybe the jailers too. We see on a video on the death and execution of Socrates how his friends were able to come and stay with Socrates for his entire last day on earth. So how should we interpret the advice Ignatius provides in his epistles to the various churches? Let us ponder the opinions of two leading scholars, one Anglican, one Orthodox. Henry Chadwick, an Anglican academic, contrasts early Christianity with the more mature Christian church, which has a common creed, a canon of scripture, and a recognized ministry with defined powers, and there's little scope for deviation. But Ignatius did not have these resources. Ignatius could only fall back on the personal element, the authority of the bishop and the clergy. And Chadwick points out that St. Ignatius emphasizes the authority of the clergy, the hatred of heresy and schism, and the glory of martyrdom. And in his epistles, St. Ignatius insists that there be unity in the churches and that the members respect the bishops. He also tells them that a liturgy or sacrament that is not blessed by the bishop is not valid, and that the faithful should be loyal and obedient to their bishop. Now, the Orthodox scholar John Anthony McGuckin has a different point of view. He argues that St. Ignatius, with other early church leaders, begins the development of the church hierarchy, how Ignatius' key text, advocating the duty of all to obey the ruling bishop implicitly and without question, became a title marker of the move toward single episcopal presidency in the churches. Also, the bishop is elevated as the efficient symbol, or the sacrament of the unity of the church, and is the chief legitimator of sacraments of baptism, Eucharist, and marriage. And he has a chapter in his book on how the church hierarchy evolved in early Christianity, which is a potential topic for a later video. Seven epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch have been preserved, written during his journey to his martyrdom of Rome. Like St. Paul, Ignatius wrote epistles to the Ephesians and to the Romans, and also to the Magnesians and to the Tralians. Now, in Revelations, letters were written to the seven churches, including Ephesus, Smyrna, and Philadelphia. These three churches are in Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. Ignatius also wrote epistles to the Philadelphians and to the Smyrnians, and St. Ignatius wrote an epistle to his fellow bishop, Polycarp. Now, the translator tells us that St. Ignatius' epistle to the Romans is the most popular and widely quoted of his epistles. 
He does not warn the Romans of heresies or chide them for disobeying their clergy or causing dissension as he does in his other epistles, but rather St. Ignatius pines for his joyous martyrdom in the arena of Rome. Repeatedly, St. Ignatius begs the Christians in Rome not to seek a pardon to prevent his martyrdom. And Ignatius writes this rhapsody, In the fullness of life I am yearning for death with all the passion of a lover. Earthly longings have been crucified, in me there is left no spark of desire for mundane things, but only a murmur of living water that whispers within me, Come to the Father. There is no pleasure for me in any meats that perish or in the delights of this life. I am fain for the bread of God, even the flesh of Jesus Christ, who is the seed of David. And for my drink I crave that blood of his, which is love imperishable. And Ignatius says this, I am his wheat, ground fine by the lion's teeth, to be made purest bread for Christ. Now St. Ignatius likens his upcoming martyrdom as a Eucharist, as a sacramental offering, and also we should offer our lives as a sacrament to the Lord, praying without ceasing, ever keeping the word of God alert in our mind, and guarding our tongues, and encouraging rather than discouraging our neighbor. And we should pray that we long for Christ as St. Ignatius longs for Christ. To die in Jesus Christ is better than to be the monarch of the earth's widest bounds. He who died for us is all I seek. He who rose again for us is my whole desire. And St. Ignatius also wrote an epistle to his beloved fellow Bishop Polycarp, encouraging him to greater service to the Lord. And the beloved story of the martyrdom of Polycarp is also included in the early Christian writings, and we'll talk about that in a future video. We learn a lesson from his greeting to his friend. My co most cordial greetings to Polycarp, who is bishop over the Smyrnian church, or rather who is God the Father for bishop over him, together with the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are a priest or a pastor or even a teacher or a parent, we need to see our authority as a loan from God who granted us authority. And indeed, God will be more the authority over us than we are the authority of those who look up to us. Honor your father and mother is a commandment to their children, but it is more a commandment to the parents to make sure they're worthy of the honor and respect in their words and deeds. And so it is with anybody who is yielding authority of any sort, including the pastor, the priest, the teacher, the parent, the employer, the judge. All these should show their love for those whom they serve. And if you're a parent or a teacher or anybody else in authority, read this passage as it would also apply to you. Support and bear lovingly those with whom you serve. Spend your time in constant prayer. Beg for every larger gifts of wisdom. Be watchful and unsleeping in spirit. Address yourself to people personally, as is the way of God himself. And carry the infirmities of them all on your own shoulders. As a good example of Christ ought to do. The heavier the labor, the richer the reward. Never tire of doing good. Never tire of encouraging. Never tire of service. Always love your neighbor and those close to you in your care. Be strict with yourself. Be like a good athlete of God. The prize is immortality and eternal life. And St. Ignatius offers more pastoral advice to Polycarp. When men and women marry, it is best that they ask for the bishop's consent, so their wedding may be a tribute to the Lord and not to their carnal desire. The honor of God should be the aim in everything. And this reminds us of Tobias in the scriptures who kneeled at his wedding bed, asking God to bless his marriage. I am now taking this kinswoman of mine, not because of lust, but with sincerity. Grant that she and I may find mercy, and that we may grow old together. St. Ignatius also has pastoral advice regarding slaves. The translator notes that many churches would use church funds to emancipate Christian slaves. And we can profitably read the passages in the church fathers and in scriptures regarding slaves when we remember that they were the employees of the ancient world, albeit employees who rarely were able to exchange a bad master for a kinder master. Now, St. Ignatius teaches us it should be the aim of the slaves to be better slaves, and for employees to be better employees, for the glory of God, so they may earn a richer freedom at his hands. They are not to set their hearts on gaining their liberty at the church's expense, for then they only become slaves to their own longing. And we explore further this concept of whether or not slaves were the employees of the ancient world in many of our videos. Also, we have a video on what slavery was like in ancient Greece and ancient Rome as part of the backdrop of history. Likewise, employees are not showing wisdom when they obsessively set their hearts on a raise they know they earned, 
or in a promotion they know that they deserve, lest they kill the desire to be dutiful and conscientious employees. And this has a personal meaning to me. It reminds me of a former colleague who was angry at his boss, who delayed giving him his review and his 5% raise for months and months and months. And his anger boiled over such that he threatened to shoot his boss. So his seething resentment caused an incident that cost his job. And this fellow was out of work for over a year, which meant that resentment over a delayed 5% raise for a few months caused him to suffer a 100% pay cut for much, much longer. Near the end of this epistle, St. Ignatius, like St. Paul, leads us onward as Christian soldiers. For a shield, take your baptism, and for a helmet, your faith, and for a spear, your love. For body armor, your patient endurance, and lay up a store of good works, as a soldier deposits his savings, so that one day you may draw the credits due to you. Be patient and gentle with one another, as God is with you. And compare this to St. Paul in Ephesians 6. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, St. Ignatius starts his epistle to the Ephesians, encouraging the parishioners to respect their clergy, for the clergy to respect their bishop, and for all to respect the community, not failing to come together for worship, as Paul puts it in Hebrews, to encourage one another. St. Ignatius teaches us, a man who excludes himself from the sanctuary is depriving himself of the bread of God. For if the prayers of one or two have power, how much more powerful are the prayers of the bishop with his old church? Anyone who refuses to attend church shows to the world his arrogance. He is excommunicating himself. And Ignatius elaborates on the Beatitude, Blessed are you when men persecute you. St. Ignatius shows us how we can all be martyrs in our daily lives. When we return good for evil, when we return compassion for scorn, when we return love for hate. Regarding the unfaithful, pray for them unceasingly. Hope that they may repent and find their way to God. Give them a chance to learn from you and your actions. Meet their animosity with mildness, their high words with humility, and their abuse with your prayers. But stand firm against their errors, and if they become violent, be gentle. Do not retaliate. Let us show by our restraint we are their brothers, and try to imitate the Lord by seeing which of us can put up with the most ill usage or privation or contempt. We live as martyrs every day when we live selflessly in faith and love for Jesus Christ. For life begins and ends with faith and love. Faith is the beginning and love is the end, and their union is God perfecting our soul. Nobody who professes faith can easily commit sin, and nobody who possesses love can feel hatred. The translator tells us that this following passage was frequently quoted by the church fathers. Mary's virginity was hidden from the prince of this world, and so were her childbearing, and so was the death of the Lord. All these three trumpet-tongued secrets were brought to pass in the deep silence of God. How were they made known to the world? Up in the heavens a star gleamed out, more brilliant than all the rest. No words could describe its luster, its strangeness bewildered men. The other stars and the sun and the moon gathered around it in chorus, but this star outshone them all. The translator tells us, The devil was completely hoodwinked by the secrecy of the Incarnation. How resounding is the overwhelming silence of God, the still quiet voice that Elisha heard in the midst of the tempest. And in the epistle to the Magnesians, even in the midst of persecution, the early church experienced the same sort of pettiness that we see today. This epistle was written to the church where some splintered into their own group because they didn't like the new young bishop that was appointed. St. Ignatius warns them, Be as submissive to the bishop and to one another as Jesus Christ was to his Father, and as the apostles were to Christ and the Father, so there may be complete unity in the flesh as well as in the Spirit. Now nobody likes the word submit. Many women dislike and many men like the admonition by St. Paul to the Ephesians that a wife should submit to their husband. Both men and women overlook the preceding verses that exhort all Christians to submit to one another. It's a matter of respect. Without respect there can be no love, but if we do not honor our father or mother and those in authority, we cannot truly love our neighbor. And if we do not honor God's name and God's Sabbath, we cannot truly love God. We must be considerate to one another. As St. Ignatius urges us, you must show every consideration for one another, never letting your attitude to a neighbor be affected by your human feelings, 
but simply loving each other consistently in the spirit of Jesus Christ. St. Ignatius greets the Smyrnians. Glory be to Jesus Christ, the Divine One who has gifted you with such wisdom. I have seen how immovably settled in faith you are, nailed body and soul to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, rooted and grounded in love by his blood. Living a godly life is crucial, but belief does matter. Belief in Christ allows the Holy Spirit to enable us to live a godly life boldly with confidence and assurance, eager to suffer for our faith and for the good as did Christ and the martyrs. Jesus submitted to suffering for our sake that salvation might be ours. Suffer he did just as he raised himself. And so Ignatius asks, To what end have I given myself up to perish by fire or sword of savage beasts? And the translator notes that he would suffer all these three torments in his martyrdom. St. Ignatius continues, When I am surrounded by lions, I am surrounded by God. It is only in the name of Jesus Christ and for the sake of sharing his sufferings that I could face my impending martyrdom, for he, the perfect man, gives me strength. Now this recalls when the prophet Daniel was thrown in the lion's den for worshiping God when a royal decree forbade it, and God shut the mouths of the lions. This also recalls the three young men and the angel who walked and sung praises to God in the midst of a flaming furnace. These three men said to the king of Babylon, before he threw them in the furnace, If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not serve the golden statue that you have set up. And St. Ignatius reminds us that we should have faith in God. Faith and love are everything, and faith and love must come before all else. But some men have perverted notions about the grace of Jesus Christ, contrary to the mind of God. They have no care for love, no thought for the widow and the orphan, not at all for the afflicted, the captive, the hungry, or the thirsty. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. We have sampled several translations of the writings of the Apostolic Fathers, and in my opinion, they're all pretty good. And I'm going to relate some of the comments Bart Ehrman made in his lecture in The Great Courses. And he shares that when he first read his epistle to the Smyrnians in the original Greek, that it literally told him that the bishop should be present when they baptize and make love. And he was thinking, this must be a pretty interesting congregation. But after further thought, he realized that what St. Ignatius meant was that the bishop should be present for baptisms and love feasts. And love feasts is how the ancient church referred to the Lord's Supper. Bart Ehrman has also been translating the writings of all the Apostolic Fathers, and the problem he faced when translating the Ignatius epistles was that our saint was in such a rush in writing these epistles, he made numerous grammatical and linguistic errors. And the dilemma is, if the translator corrects these errors, the reader loses the sense of how rushed he was when he was writing these epistles. But if he preserved these errors in English, then the reader would fault the translator. And so Bart Ehrman chose to try to retain the original rush nature of the epistles with explanations in the footnotes. And there are several manuscripts of Ignatius in Greek, Latin, and other languages of varying lengths. The Greek manuscripts of the middle length are preferred, uh, since the longer manuscript is newer. As Pelican notes, scholars sometimes prefer the manuscripts that more closely match their theological beliefs, and there are differences between the longer and shorter manuscripts. Bart Ehrman is one of the foremost textual critics of the New Testament, which means his academic specialty is analyzing the original Greek manuscripts to determine as accurately as possible what the original text said. Unfortunately, he has lost his faith, he is now an agnostic, and he is also the leading historical Jesus scholar, and we also have a video on this topic. We're going to make a video of book reviews on the sources of the early apostolic fathers. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons, and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.